interpreting. Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to this meeting of the Ukraine Socialist Solidarity Campaign. And this is the, my name is John Ryman. I'm the co-chair of the campaign along with Cheryl Zuer, who can't be here for this meeting. This is the first, this meeting is the first in, the, in a two part series on what is happening in Ukraine and in Russia. And uh, we think that in addition to mobilizing support, what support we can for Ukraine, we also need to help develop a deeper understanding of this war and the general political situation that has led to it. And this meeting will be recorded and will be posted uh, on Facebook, on our uh, Facebook group, as well as elsewhere. Um, so before we get started, is everybody familiar with the raise hand uh, uh, system, how, how that works on, on YouTube? Okay, well, I'm gonna assume that everybody is. Um, so that's how when people will get recognized to speak, um, <clears throat> because I can't physically see everybody if they raise their hand like that. Um, second, we'd like ask everybody to mute themselves unless they're speaking, because otherwise background sounds can can come in. So. The way that the meeting is going to be organized, Vladislav will speak for approximately a half an hour, followed by a general discussion. And we're gonna ask speakers to limit their speaking time to two minutes so that we can get in as many people as possible. Um, if anybody has any specific questions that they need clarified, then Vladislav will reply at that time. But other than that, uh, he's going to reserve his comments for the end of the discussion, at which time he'll have about 15 minutes or so to respond to questions and to summarize. And I interviewed Vladislav back in March for my blog site, at which time I think that the best summary of his position was he said, you need to defend workers and your country. And uh, Vladislav Starodubsev is a historian of Central and Eastern Europe, a social activist, and a member of the RADA, which is the collective leadership body of the Ukraine Democratic Socialist Organization, Socialny Rup. So with, with that, um, we're very happy to have Vladislav here. And uh, go ahead, Vladislav. Yeah, thank you. I probably will start with uh, the most uh, important things that happened in Ukraine that you of course all already seen in the news is about offense uh, in Kharkiv and Kherson that resulted in astonishing victory for the Ukrainian army and liberated a big chunk of territory probably the most uh, for like uh, all major wars uh, for 50 years in this in history of, of the world was one of the fastest and uh, most successful offensive, I think. And uh, with this offensive, Ukrainian forces uh, came to the cities of Izum, Kupiansk, and a lot more uh, on the Kharkiv region and secured uh, some important strategic points in the Kherson region. Uh, basically, the military victory was success because of uh, different strategic maneuvers of uh, relocation of Ukrainian uh, army and uh, attacks on both fronts that just uh, uh, didn't give a possibility for Russian army to concentrate in one point, in one front, and with uh, problems with logistics and with supplies that were forced, uh, forced uh, by uh, artillery strikes on their railroads, on their uh, military depots, and so on and so on. Uh, they were... Uh, very hampered in their relocation possibilities, and Ukrainian forces striked uh, very rapidly on the Kharkiv uh, direction, liberating a lot of cities. Uh, with the liberation of the cities, a lot of a lot of signs of uh, really different, uh, really like awful uh, war crimes were appearing, especially in Izum, where. A lot of mass graves were found with, uh, with a lot of civilian people killed, 
killed in very masochistic and awful ways and very sadistic. Uh, and uh, this just shows the nature of uh, Russian occupation in Ukraine. A lot of things that we don't see could happen at any moment now in the occupied regions, including mass murders, uh, political repressions, uh, very sadistic kind of repressions and just tortures uh, to the civilian people or political prisoners, especially for prisoners of war uh, happening in the occupied regions. And uh, basically, this Ukrainian army liberating the cities, these atrocities became public and uh, a lot of mass graves were found, especially in ISM. And uh, I think uh, we can say, say for sure that in other occupied towns, something similar could happen. But yeah, with this military victory, uh, the situation became more radical in the region and with such defeat uh, suffered by Russia, uh, they pursued to declare so-called partial mobilization. But partial is only on words. They're trying to mobilize practically everyone to just uh, reinforce their army and to gain at least some prestige and stability of the regime in the situation of uh, such horrible military defeats on the front line. At the moment, they're literally uh, violently uh, force people to join army, people without any experience, and mostly of uh, non-Russian ethnicity background. The mobilization in Russia goes in very ethno-nationalist uh, lines, where, for example, officials in Moscow said that the first people to be mobilized will be uh, immigrants in the city that are uh, low paid, uh, have nothing to lose, and so on and so on. And they were saying this, uh, presenting this as a gift. They are saying that, okay, we will uh, give the possibility for immigrants to easier getting a Russian citizenship that could provide benefits in workplace and so on and so on. So they're kind of using uh, such very ra racist uh, ways to replenish their army, mostly with people uh, that uh, most of majority uh, majority population of Russia, privileged population, don't care about. Uh, this like uh, invisible part of the society, migrants and ethnic minorities. In Crimea region, they mobilized uh, uh, a few thousand people. And from this uh, amount of people, 80% were ethnical Crimean Tatars. But uh, they consist, uh, consist only like, population of Crimean Tatars is only 20% of the population of Crimean region, but they're 80% of the population of mobilized people. In Buryatia, 10% of all uh, minority population are mobilized. So Russian states are actively pushing uh, genocidal form of mobilization that affects only and uh, very unequal uh, national minorities uh, and uh, low paid workers, uh, people with very fragile state or invisible parts of society uh, and uh, mostly securing uh, peaceful life for ordinary white Russian citizen. So in this situation, Russia says that they want to mobilize 300,000 people, but with the scale and uh, their methods of mobilization, it seems that uh, these takes are untrue and the mobilization will take probably twice or three uh, more people, uh, up, up probably to a million, to be sent uh, to Ukraine to die and to fight. So this horrible political development in Russia uh, also starts a new phase of war, uh, a more brutal, a more hard phase for war. Uh, when Russia admitted that they're losing the so-called special military operation and preparing for full-scale assault using everything they have. At the moment, they're, use, uh, they're starting to use uh, pretty old Soviet equipment. Uh, Russian army was uh, made like for all of this period of Putin regime to be a professional army, a small-scale elite force that could achieve uh, strategic uh, objectives uh, in very small groups uh, 
like you can uh, you could see the actions in Syria or other countries, for example, in Georgia. But uh, this invasion of Ukraine, this strategy failed, and Russia tries to reimagine their army as mass army. And for this, they are using all Soviet equipment of uh, even Stalin era, using this equipment to replenish their ammunition and supplies for the new army groups that they are already forming. So of course, it creates uh, a lot of uh, hard situation for Ukraine uh, because uh, Ukrainian army being uh, pretty uh, well trained uh, and adopting some of the NATO tactics that are more suitable than Soviet old ones and Russian to this conflict and using new and modern equipment, but they're still outnumbered, they're out, uh, outgunned, they have a lot less ammunition, a lot less supplies, a lot less of uh, industrial capacities to provide basic military needs to the army. A lot of just very general and basic things that every army needs, like for example, helmets, and uh, in some uh, in some cases, even weapons are provided not by the state, but by the volunteers that's spending their own monies and try to find, for example, in other states, in other countries, uh, and needed, su needed supplies for uh, arming Ukrainian army. Because of the strong neoliberal, uh, neoliberal reforms in uh, military sector and outgoing privatization of uh, military industry, state cannot finance army enough. They're doing all of this neoliberal cuts and trying to uh, shorten the budget of Ukrainian army as much. Uh, and this creates this horrible situation that a lot of uh, basic necessities for the army are providing uh, volunteers and not the state. And of course, it creates a uh, situation where Ukrainian army uh, of course, even uh, in, uh, if you count uh, like possibilities or, and industrial base of U Ukraine, it's pretty outgunned. And uh, this creates need for pushing uh, more campaigns to arm the Ukrainian army in this situation, because to withstand such general mobilization and such uh, industrial capacities of Russian state, you need a modern army that can uh, outmatch uh, massive capabilities of Russian army. Um, also, with uh, situation in front, there are some developments on like so, so, uh, societal front in Ukraine. Uh, I would say that this period is more is more safe for workers. No strong like anti-workers laws were pushed, but uh, the main topic in the political discussion in Ukraine now among the highest elite, uh, political elite is uh, tax reform and social cuts. They're trying uh, and they're pushing laws uh, to just uh, uh, unite all the social funds into one fund and uh, in process of uniting, cutting all the spending everywhere where it's possible. So in such ways, they're trying to limit the independent uh, possibilities of a uh, uh, pensions fund and uh, radically limit pensions that they will pay uh, to replenish budget for new tax cuts for the businesses and new privileges for uh, ruling class. So such reforms are already undergoing and uh, they could uh, in theory harm general population very seriously. Uh, especially old and very fragile uh, people that are uh, at the moment are not working and uh, have uh, pensions as uh, their only uh, money source, uh, it will harm a lot of them, especially in the situation of rising prices uh, and inflation. The next thing is tax reform. Our officials propose a very awful, <laughs> absolutely awful tax reform but it uh, creates a lot of backlash uh, in the ruling party uh, and created a conflict between Ministry of uh, Economy and other parts of the uh, Zelensky party. So some, some parts of the party saying that such radical reform would uh, just destroy all of the uh, state cap capabilities in Ukraine at the moment, and it's absolutely awful. And uh, 
passing kids would be a great mistake. And other part thinks that uh, by making uh, new tax cuts will create a possibility for business to develop economy and so on and so on. Uh, you know that bullshit is trickle down economy and uh, speaking about business confidence in the cities that are literally bombed with rockets. I think business feel very confident uh, thinking that every day it could be bombed. Like, yeah, so they're proposing a tax reform that called 10, 10, 10, uh, 10 income tax, uh, 10 corporate tax and 10% uh, uh, tax sales, uh, tax on sales. So this is absolutely off the tax uh, and just kind of, uh, I think the lowest one in Europe and a lot lower than in US, where I think you have a 35 only corporate tax and income tax probably even bigger. But uh, in the situation of Ukraine, uh, we have a very small all of these taxes and most of our taxes are regressive or flat. And uh, in this situation, they're just trying to um, they regulate and create cuts for the budget as much as possible. And uh, for replenish, replenishing the budget, they're engaging in privatization. Even military industrial complex is subject to privatization, which creates um, a lot of fragileness uh, in Ukraine army and uh, in Ukraine possibility to depend. They're pushing these neoliberal reforms uh, as they're thinking that uh, this is a better way for them to replenish the budget than doing uh, taxation for the businesses. Uh, in such situations, they're just cutting everything and prioritizing everything they can. Uh, at the same time, they are deregulating the economy as much as possible for the same uh, sake of uh, so-called business confidence. They're uh, uniting all of the state commissions uh, on the regulation of ecology regulation, on the workers' regulation, into one big commission uh, with a lot of firing workers. And it's it's general trend that a lot of state services are mass firing workers uh, without without any compensation because we don't have a strong budget at the moment and we are kind of running a very, very bad budget in Ukraine uh, with the war and stuff. So a lot of firings and a lot of cuts to all state service, especially for that, that are regulating the economy or provide some, for example, workers, uh, commission on work, uh, commission of uh, forest, uh, commission on uh, like water sources and so on and so on. They've been cut and merged into one commission that uh, became practically pointless because one commission cannot be experts <laughs> at the same time uh, uh, in the question of labor regulation and the question of uh, forest securities. So what they are doing is absolutely hampering uh, all the possibility of state to regulate the economy and uh, ec ecology and so societal life in Ukraine. Uh, with this, they're also pushing cuts uh, to the financing of culture, uh, very important thing in Ukraine at the moment because of the, of course, of the uh, need of national development and the development of Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian language, and Ukrainian identity. They're cutting uh, on the cultural events and uh, they're cutting on financing of uh, one of the well known uh, Kiev and Ukrainian cinema archive uh, and cultural center, the Vzhenko Center, uh, where was a big fight. Uh, for the businesses and uh, basically, basically leaders of housing markets, big companies try to privatize this territory for building a new uh, living, living quarters and so on. So this produced a big scandal in Kyiv, uh, which stopped for a moment uh, cuts to the cinema center and saved it from close closing but the uh, Ministry of Culture actively pushes to just destroy all of the most important uh, cultural centers in Kyiv and in general in Ukraine and using the war as a possibility to promote uh, as much tax uh, as much uh, cuts to the cultural sector as possible and to sell everything to uh, city corporations mostly housing ones uh, that are that will build uh, uh, 
and another stupid stupid skyscraper on the place of cultural center and uh, practically destroying all all public spaces in the cities um the same war situation in Min, uh, means Ministry of Region, uh, Region Integration. Uh, this is the ministry that are working uh, on the possibilities of reintegrating Donbas, Lugansk, and Crimea regions. And uh, they were known for some horrible of uh, uh, policies and proposals made in these months. Mostly it's about repressions to the people who are collaborated with Russian regime in any way possible. And uh, such uh, their uh, policy proposals are actually very harmful and produce uh, so society conflict uh, and uh, uh, conflict between people who are living in different regions on just uh, a blank space. Um, they were saying that they will uh, they, uh, they will force a criminal responsibility for everyone who gets a Russian passport in the regions, for everyone who votes in the referendum, and for everyone who works in general on any work in the occupied region that are provided by Russians. So this creates the, the situation uh, where people just isolated uh, and uh, they are basically facing uh, two ways. Russians going to them door by door with the weapons and saying that if you want to vote, we'll either kill you or repress or go to, to jail. And Ukrainians that are saying that if you vote, you will face criminal responsibility. Uh, such sentiments of uh, Ministry of uh, Regional Reintegration are widely cri criticized, criticized in Ukrainian society, but uh, they are producing uh, such policy proposals uh, every week and creates a, really, a lot of so, societal conflicts and scandals, and uh, it's a big issue at the moment. Um, in this month, there also was a first strike uh, for this um, for the all duration of work uh, of war, and it was strike by the workers of Novolinsk because of the corrupt management enforced on their coal plant. Uh, the situation with coal plants is uh, pretty awful in Ukraine uh, because also of this neoliberal uh, policies and cuts, uh, government does not provide any possibility of exiting uh, the ecological harmful uh, professions and jobs. And these coal plants are being financially, uh, uh, financially, and I, I, I don't know how to, to say it in English, but they just don't pay for, for themselves and they're being uh, clo closed in all of the Ukraine and such uh, coal plants that are not closed are usually a pretty big place for corruption and for just uh, stealing of everything that uh, exists in there. And coal, mi coal miners and people who work in the sphere is more usually very uh, very fragile part of society and they're undergoing uh, possibility of losing jobs, losing their houses because all, a lot of Ukrainian cities are built around coal mines and basically losing uh, all their way, ways of living. And uh, the situation in Novovolinsk, it's combination of these factors of uh, possibility of losing jobs, of uh, government does not provide uh, any possibilities of uh, exiting this job and having a new one uh, in more ecologically friendly sector. And uh, we've uh, enforced very corrupt officials that are acting as some authoritarian leaders on this mi uh, mines and actually stealing uh, mines equipment and not paying wages and so on and so on uh, in the process. So uh, it started a first strike from, uh, from the time of the war and first major uh, workers' action in Ukraine, uh, which I don't know uh, is succeeded or not, uh, but it shows the general tendency that people are not afraid to, to strike 
as the government uh, does not intervene much in the situation. Even if uh, the war situation strikes are prohibited, but uh, no legal pressure was put uh, on these workers from the state, only from their private companies uh, that they were employed on. And probably the last thing, uh, actually, the most important uh, uh, things that happened in Ukraine is, of course, social Ruch, Ukraine Democratic Socialist Organization Congress, where a new Rada was elected, and I'm no longer uh, a member of uh, collective leadership of this organization from uh, from big early, but uh, a new uh, organizational leadership was choose, uh, chosen with uh, a lot of new people, uh, a lot of uh, people who are recently in involved, in, uh, involved in the left movement, and we are, uh, as an organization uh, adopted a resolution and uh, uh, did some um how you say it and i analyzed our work for this year and uh, watched at the results uh from the start of the war actually ukrainian left gave a lot of ground our organization uh, grown twice and for the left in ukrainian society uh they become a lot more place because of ukrainian people seeing that ukrainian left are actively participating on the front lines and uh, listening to the masses and defending the country, defending uh, independence, uh, and uh, actually at the same time defending the rights of the workers, a lot of people became more friendly and more helpful to the left, even people who were before very hostile. So this creates a, a very good situation for left to grow, and our organization grow in numbers twice, uh, and uh, for now, it's it's kind of small, but uh, it's one of the biggest. It's the biggest uh, left wing organization in Ukraine with more than one hundred people, and uh, half of them are at the moment active, and active in trade union organization uh, organizing in the front lines, in the army, uh, in the humanitarian help, and engaging all the uh, different campaigns for securing working rights, for the securing social rights, for creating analysis or doing uh, just uh events like uh, i am at the moment so it was an important conference uh where i would say that social ruch uh, um firstly looks more professional and more prepared to be a real socialist party in ukraine and not just an ngo that we are in the moment and with it uh, i think it really uh mm, pushed the spirit of the left a lot higher and show, showed how much possible to do even in such small numbers. Um, we helped uh, to, uh, a lot of trade union collectives that are fighting in the army and struggling with the equipment, with the weapons, with the armor plates, with the supplies. We helped the uh, city of Mykolaiv where there were uh, water so shortages, uh, shortages because of uh, Russia bombing water plants and uh, constantly problems with food with water and everything uh, which we organized convoys with other anarchist social democratic and feminist organizations that uh, were helping us and uh, organized help to N uh, npgu independent uh, miners union in the crivery providing uh all Serious material for the people in the army and so on, and it all was done by a pretty small organization. And we had our congress uh, a week ago. So yeah, I think on this I probably will end my short presentation on the current situation in Ukraine. And if you have any questions or anything to add, uh, you're welcome. Well, thanks very much, Vladislav. Um, before we go to a general discussion, are, is there any like specific questions or like points of clarification that that people have? If not, okay, uh, Nina, and uh, I've got everybody on mute, so you're gonna have to unmute yourself. 
Okay, Nina and then Simon. And then after, after that, then if people have, uh, you know, uh, more lengthy comments and, and so on, they could keep it to within two minutes. That would be great. Uh, Nina, go ahead. Uh, yes, I don't know if this is the kind of question you had in mind, but my question to Vladislav is um, when he says, uh, or when I should say to you, Vladislav, when you say um, the left, it sounds like you're, it sounds very unified. So my question is, is it the left, Ukrainian left unified? Um, yeah, is, is it unified? And maybe I didn't even hear you say it. Correct. Okay, thanks, Nina. Then, Simon, if you have a question, and then after that, maybe Vladislav would like to answer those two questions. Actually, another question because you were saying about clarification. So I just want to say because Vladislav was saying about the Congress. Um, well, hold hold I on have... just one second, Simon. Let's let uh, let's let Vladislav answer that that yeah. question. And Something then, major. Okay. Then yeah. Look. Go ahead, Vladislav. Um, basically, yeah, all of the Ukrainian left are unified on the most basic issues, like, uh, for example, um, there are no different opinions. There are no two opinions on the question of the war. Everyone knows that uh, you need to defend your country, you need to defend your people. Everyone on the left participates uh, in the army or in the humanitarian aid, military aid, and so on and so on. No two questions between social democrats, anarchists, democratic socialists, Trotskyists, everyone on the line. Uh, and uh, like, except Stalinists, but uh, there are like no Stalinist organizations uh, like that are existing in Ukraine non-virtually non at the moment. So yeah, all of the left united uh, in this very basic demands of like securing Ukrainian independence and fighting against Russian imperialism. Nobody finds any disagreement with this. And in other questions, I, I would say that we have a very strong like, community feeling in the left. We have uh, common spaces, uh, common events, uh, and uh, people from like more anarchist background cooperated with us. We are cooperating with them. Uh, we have spaces to drink beer and so and so on. There are of course a lot of conflicts, some small conflicts, uh, but I would say that especially when the war started. Before the war, it was a lot of different spaces with very small amount of the people of people that are working separately in the different directions. But now it's uh, one big general space where everyone could uh, meet each other and speak and uh, uh, actually united uh, in the, the, the main problem and the answer includes, so, yeah. Thanks very much, Vladislav. So, so Simon, you have some comments that you wanted to raise and again if people can i don't see a whole lot of people raising their hands so for the moment you know you can speak for a little over uh, i don't want to speak too much i just want to say about the conference uh, what i was saying because uh, actually um i was behalf of uh, the european network of solidarity with ukraine we were uh, there was four of us um, in kiev in uh, last week on the on the conference and um, i just want to say that uh, we would we just witnessed a congress of organization who is very young and vital so it's it's really worth to to see the development of social um, who have who who those of you do, who don't know the organization should really um, take a little bit of interest uh, about uh, about uh, this ukrainian left organization um, because it's um, first of all uh, very unique in the in the ukrainian political space although it's small but but i think it should you know um, for people who are uh, in solidarity with ukrainian resistance but also uh, are quite critical of the neoliberal reforms that are that are happening in the country um, that should be i think one of the first places you going to look for people like like-minded and it was a very well organized conference for a small group, I would say. And we had uh, uh, also the Zoom uh, connection. So there was over, I think, 
Vadisov can correct me if I'm wrong, over 100 people. I think there was like 40 people on the conference and there was like 60 people on the Zoom uh, from around, from the, from, I've seen from around the world, I've seen people from US as well. So uh, just my short experience from a conference, uh, but also from, from Kiev as, as such, because we are uh, there three days. So I was there three days. So we spent quite a uh, lot of uh, time on, on political discussions and also on seeing how does Kiev look like in the time of the war. Although it's changed because I, I've been there a few times in my life, uh, it, you can still see some signs of war, like uh, that the, the alarms, some, some people tend to tend to hide when the alarms uh, are start, uh, the, 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 the alarm starts some still stay in the restaurant that what we that what we witnessed uh, you can take photos there, there is um, you you have to be um, actually home at night although the police uh, stopped us at some point and didn't we didn't have too much problems with that with, uh, where we are uh, going back on a, in a taxi and um, i think the most visible thing you can see in kiev um, is the fact that uh, all the monuments are covered because uh, because of the safety reasons. Uh, but still, uh, the life goes pretty normal. So it's it's still uh, quite away from the front line. But uh, but the city is as I I basically remember it a few years ago. Very vibrant. Very. It's a very big city. It's a, a very uh, nice place to see actually. So I think one of the the things we can do in solidarity with Ukraine is also uh, try to be uh, not scared and try to visit Ukraine as well as much as we can. First of all, to see the place and second of all, to show uh, our sol solidarity as well. And that's all. Thanks, Simon. So, uh, Ted, you're, you're next. Uh, you're going to have to unmute yourself and also Talmadge after Ted. Go ahead, Ted. Okay. So, um, thank you, Vladislav. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try to just be sort of succinct if I can. And what you said and what you read in the newspapers a little bit or and online is that the government is in the process of all these neoliberal counter reforms. Uh, attack, direct attacks on working class rights and dismantling government regulatory agencies and social programs. And intuitively, this seems counter to organizing a, mo a war mobilization. And it, I have not heard of, and maybe there are none, but in major mass mobilizations for wars, like in the United States in the Second World War or many countries, you have measures like price controls, wage controls, rationing. And I haven't heard of any of those things in Ukraine. It doesn't mean they're not happening. I'd like to know. And the other side of this question is, it's not directly related to the first question, but it is related. Ukraine once had a huge military industry that was part of the Soviet military complex. And I know that it was downsized when Ukraine became uh, an independent country, but it still had a major production capacity. And I'm wondering what you can tell us about Ukraine's ability to produce its own weapons and material of war, you know, from, from AK-47s to uniforms. And because this is an important issue because if Ukraine is entirely dependent on Western Europe and the United States, Ukraine is, 
much weaker than if it has its own independent capacity. Okay, the last thing I have to ask you is, if you have documents from the conference, social movement that have been, that are public and translated into English, it would be great if you could share them with us so we could share them. And that's all. Thank you again. Thanks, Ted. Um, so um, Talmud's next. Yeah, I'll keep my comments short. I, I really want to echo Ted's questions as well. I, I really would like to hear some answers to that. Um, I think probably, and, and let me just say thank you, Vladislav, and some of you know for your comments. I really appreciate hearing it directly from people who are on the front lines with this process. Um, I've been following this for some time, the struggle, and the questions I really have are probably more to do with us in the United States and the West in terms of the problem of the left. Um, I've been on many fights with fellow Marxists. Uh, comrades who I've had to cut loose um, just because they have what they call the anti-imperialism of idiots. Um, and I want to know, in a sense, how we as a body can grapple with our comrades on the left who seem to be unwilling to see Ukrainians as the victims here um, and rather kind of buy into the Putin's line. So part of this has to do with how do we reach uh, other members of the public that are you know, profess to be for social justice, profess to be for revolution and change, et cetera, but who like Roger Waters from Pink Floyd, were more than happy to parrot the Putin line and get banned from his concert in Poland, for example, this recently just happened. Um, and so I, the question I have from you, for you guys is, what are the pedagogical methods that we can use other than shunning our comrades that seem to have such a rigid Stalinist almost personality uh, for grappling with Ukrainian issues. Um, and then when we try to even introduce um, figures that are often uh, anathema to leftist perspectives, whether it's State Department and you know, officials talking or whatever, how do we create a more nuanced narrative about Ukrainians' involvement in this war and how Russia is still the criminal in this whole process with comrades that we supposedly have worked with for years in the past on other issues. That's really my main my main question I have for, you, for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Virginia. Uh, uh, also, if I don't do it for you, would people please lower their hands after they speak? Go ahead, Virginia, please. Uh, sure, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering before February 24th, um, when there might there were investigations into oligarchical corruption, when um, any, any left would have clearly had views on how they regarded sort of, presumably in some instances, monopoly takeover of grain production, say by Cargill and things like that. What happened? to that kind of investigative um, effort um, when February 24th happened. <laughs> that, that's my question, really, if it makes sense, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Stanley? My question is, does the social movement have a website in English with statements, press releases, photos, memes? It would be very useful for us in our battles with the tankies. Uh, they're half pacifist, half Stalinist. It would be good if there would be uh, lists of people who would like to be interviewed from a social movement. Uh, as you know, we, be, we get attacked by the Stalinists for being apologists for the State Department. But if we had uh, Ukrainians who would be saying this and that, that would uh, be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Stanley. Well, I'd like to make I'd like to make a couple of a couple of points. Well, first of all, a question um, for Vladislav is: Can you talk a little bit about the mood and the general consciousness in Ukraine? Are you know like how people see the issue of the war? Are you know there's been a lot of uh, claims here in the United States 
that the United States is willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. In other words, that there's no interest in Ukraine in fighting Russia. Is there a mood of, is there a certain tiredness developing? Um, you talk, a, and also how are people in general, you talk about what sound like neoliberal reforms. How do people see, how do workers see that? And how does that affect their, their thinking about the invasion? Um, you know, somebody raised the, I, I think was, I think was Talmadge talked about what is, what some of us are calling the RT left for Russia today. It's the so-called left that really has adopted the point of view of, <clears throat> of like RT and, and so on. And in my own experience, it's about as fruitful trying to talk with them as it is trying to talk with workers who, um, who support uh, Trump. It's just like a different reality and the actual facts don't matter. And <clears throat> uh, one thing that I think is really important in this and in the role of social movement is that I think that a new socialist and, and anarchist tendency Will, uh, movement will have to start developing. And I think that social movement can play a key role in, in that. Um, we do have to think about how we can link up more with working class people who are not active in the left in any way. And I think that one issue that we should consider raising is this issue of expropriations which we know that the United States and other governments has, have expropriated or seized uh, various luxury yachts of some of the key, um, some of the key uh, Russian oligarchs. But that's really just chump change because their real wealth in the West is invested in Maine in real estate. And so why should that not be seized? But then we have to go a step further because you have the Ukrainian oligarchs who have been looting the country for years. And you have, some of them have, uh, have supported Putin, some of them not. But why should their assets in the West not also be seized? And then you have to go a little bit further. You have the oil industry, which has been profiting enormously from this war. Why should their assets not be seized? And I, I think, that we should think about how we can develop a campaign around that as a way of linking up support for the struggle of the Ukrainian people for independence and also um, how that links up with the class interests of workers here in the United States and other countries. And of course, I'd be interested in, in hearing Vladislav's uh, point of view as far as seizing the real assets of these different uh, oligarchs, both in Russia and in Ukraine, and how that would be seen. Are there, are there, any, other, are there any other questions? If, if there aren't any other comments, then maybe Vladislav would like to come back in and we'll see if there's uh, further comments from there. Yeah, okay, then I will start because I have two pages of question. <laughs> okay, uh, where do I start? The, okay, from the easiest one. Uh, documents of the conference of uh, Social Ruch will be uh, available a little bit later. We are doing class editions and we will translate it in English and publish. And uh, our main page of information is Facebook. I will send you a link. Uh, on our website, we publish most of our materials, but it's uh, mostly secondary to the Facebook page. So I will send you a Facebook page so you could, could have updates about our activities. And a lot of materials there are in English or could be translated via Facebook translation. So it's about easy questions. As about war measures by, by Ukrainian government, I would say the was a period with uh, like uh, uh, price controls and so on. Not much, uh, mostly like price controls on the fuel and just it. Uh, but and 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 on food. 
but now nothing like this. Um, only like government provides humanitarian aid in terms of uh, food and shelters for the people. Uh, very bad shelters. Most most of the shelters are really organized by volunteers, but they are not even doing a rent control in the situation where uh, some cities doubled in population because of. Uh, uh, internal migration because of war. They are not doing basic, the most important thing, uh, helping to find jobs uh, and uh, housing for the people. So these uh, in Lviv, for example, prices for housing, they just skyrocketed. Like uh, in some places, it's 700% uh, over uh, the price that was uh, before the war. And government does nothing about this. They're, doing some populist uh, phrases and so on and so on, but really nothing. It's uh, uh, very counterproductive policies, uh, even in like military production and uh, like in usual situation of war, you need some centralization of resources and some centralization, uh, it's uh, control for the production. It's necessary for the military equipment, for the humanitarian aid, for the basic needs, for the electricity, for example, because yeah, electricity is main strategic point, but nothing like this was done. Uh, contrary, privatization continues, even of the strategic uh, industries of the military. So it uh, creates a really a lot of uh, points and places where Ukrainian government actually pretty weak and cannot uh, do all its uh, all of uh, necessities uh, that are needed in times of war. Because like, yeah, normal government in times of war would promote some clean Asian policies, regulation, control of the most important production, nothing like this here. It's complete uh, neoliberal experiment. Uh, they are trying to do this and they are failing, uh, but they're still trying to promote their vision of a neoliberal economy, of peaceful economy in times of war. And it uh, creates a lot of problems, a lot of social problems and a lot of military problems. And uh, mostly with these problems, people deal with uh, cooperation and solidarity actions, but it's nothing on the scale of like state possibilities. So yeah, and uh, military industry mostly was sold by the Yanukovych government, which was deeply pro-Russian and non, uh, not very independent, very corrupt, uh, very imperialist, in, in sense that they, they were selling everything to Russian oligarchs. And a lot of Ukrainian army equipment were sold, uh, sold to different countries, and a lot of military contracts were established. And mostly uh, military industry uh, war was severely, severely harmed in this period. But uh, some of the high-tech part of the military industry, they were saved. And uh, uh, for example, the rocket that destroyed Russian cruiser Moskva, Moscow, uh, was made in Ukraine. It's Ukrainian rocket. It's high-tech uh, factories uh, dating from the Soviet Union that are still operating and even modernized. But there are not much of them at the moment. And for example, there are not enough ammunition plants and uh, such things. So also because of the neoliberal policies after the Maiden, uh, they didn't establish a good military industrial complex in Ukraine, in the country that was uh, in state of war from 2014. Uh, they mostly uh, outsourced everything to private corporations and they failed in it. Uh, we didn't have enough ammunition plants to provide for the army. We don't have enough uh, military equipment uh, we are using mostly old ones from Soviet era. Some of our artillery are uh, using uh, shells made under Stalin. So you can you can understand the situation here. And it creates also this uh, very cyberpunk cont uh, context uh, where you can have uh, one Soviet artillery piece from 60s and second to it is modern American HIMARS. So, yeah, and of course, it creates a lot of problems that uh, actually Ukrainian government uh, hopes that West will do everything on the industrial front from uh, for them. And uh, yeah, it creates possibility for dependencies in the situation of war, absolutely. 
And yeah, it's the real problem in Ukraine. And it's kind of creates this situation that we, we really need this weapon because we cannot, even in the best situation, we couldn't produce enough weapons uh, for facing Russian army. But it's not the best situation. We have a really collapsing military industry with some of the sectors uh, surviving and some are not. And basically, it's some of high-tech sectors survived and some of the more like basic general pro producing like ammunition are collapsed. So we have such things and we have a lot of problems with artillery, uh, a lot of problems with equipment, with the most of the uh, equipment being outdated. And, you know, a lot of people saying that, okay, uh, we probably give enough weapons for Ukraine and so on and so on. Probably every now have like uh, modern NATO standards, ammunition, uh, guns, artillery, but it's not true. Um, most of the weapons that uh, are uh, sent by the Western powers are going on the front line in, and like two weeks and uh, they're gone. And uh, they're of course not enough. They absolutely cannot fulfill uh, such massive war and such big army. So it's very important to continue to agitate for more weapons and especially for modern weapons and artillery pieces. It's absolutely important and in the situation of mobilization, absolutely it's necessary. And okay, what we have other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about oligarchs and investigations and so on and so on. Uh, basically, all of the civil society exists uh, as before the war. Uh, with the exceptions that there are no mass protests. They are not outlawed, but they could be outlawed if government decides to. Uh, but the most of the people just decide not to protest because all the attention goes to, to the war and they see this as uh, uh, unnecessary split in society. Uh, there's still some protests, as I said, uh, there are strikes and so on, and people always voice their opinion and critic uh, criticizing the government. Actually, Ukrainian population uh, survive only one week without criticizing our government. After this, it's uh, as always. Uh, so it's nothing like that the uh, uh, government shut down, so the critics and so on and so on. 80% of like Facebook posts that you will read, uh, it's about uh, Ukrainians criticizing government in Ukrainian Facebook. So the situation that uh, people are very critical and they're still uh, Corrupt, uh, like corruption investigations, uh, there's still like social campaigns, uh, everything of this goes on and continues and it never stops. Also investigation with uh, uh, like Ukrainian oligarchs, there was uh, a one investigation that uh, a lot of Ukrainian oligarchs just uh, uh, moved to safe haven uh, and have a lot of companies registered in tax haven zones uh, and even in times of war doing nothing. In the, safe, in the safety, uh, in the time where like it's illegal to uh, move from uh, move from Ukrainian border for the male population because of the mobilization law, so such investigations are going on still. Um, what workers do about neoliberal reforms? Um, some of them very angry, but don't do much. Some of them are saying that, uh, okay, uh, it's a problem, but now it's a war. Uh, we don't need to talk about this much. Uh, some, are, uh, some of them are very critical, mostly critical people who are losing their jobs and their wages, and they're trying to do anything. To, they're going to, to courts. Courts are working at the moment, and they usually get their payments or a legal case secured uh, if the situation, like illegal firings and so on. Um, but yeah, uh, most of the dissatisfaction with the reforms uh, are not very organized and not uh, evolutionized in some actions. And with all of the media speaking about the war, it's very hard to start to speak about such social issues. And with the people actually um, having some by the government having some long-term reforms, neoliberal reforms pushed, people don't understand long-term consequences, and as, especially in times of war uh, and in times of uh, like, uh, 
situation where media dominated by the tactic of the war, they just don't understand and don't want to understand what is going on on political and social fronts. It's a secondary issue. The first main issue for a lot of people is just to survive. So they are thinking about political, uh, they are not always thinking, thinking in, in political ways. Um, and about mood of the population. Okay. Um, now people are actually uh, before the, in February and in March, people just wanted to survive. In any case, uh, they were uh, ready for negotiating something because they were feeling very shocked. Uh, and there was a period where the Zelensky government negotiates, negotiated with Russia uh, about returning to 24 February uh, borders and uh, like giving some concessions. Uh, he even said that he won't join NATO, for example, and uh, having some uh, discussions with Russian elites. But now nothing like this is possible. Uh, Ukrainian people are now not thinking about 24 February borders. Nobody wants it. Uh, they're thinking about complete liberation of Ukraine, complete liberation of Crimea. And actually, a lot of people saying that we will fight until the Russian Empire will collapse because they feel that the existence of such aggressive neighbor uh, will always promote the feel of insecurity and imperialism on their border. So a lot of the people uh, really think now in this and very radical anti-imperialist way that they won't stop fighting before all of Ukraine will be liberated. And even so, like 60% of the population, according to surveys, says that uh, they won't stop fighting until the Russian Federation will collapse. So this is the general mood of population now. It's a lot more radical than uh, in the first times of war because people seeing that they have the power to defend. Uh, they have the weapons, they have the power, they have the support, and they have uh, a military success in Kharkiv uh, and Kherson that motivated them a lot. So yeah, mood of, mood of population, uh, generally of population, very militant and very supportive of military actions. And everyone uh, expects, like ha have a very great patriotic feelings and ready to defend their country. Uh, and yeah, what to do with anti-imperialists in the US and other countries and how to with so-called anti-imperialists? Actually, uh, if I knew uh, easy solutions to this problem, I wouldn't sit here. And <laughs> uh, so uh, I think speak, uh, making voices of Ukrainian and pro-Ukrainian people be heard, uh, making voices of the people, of the workers here, of the invisible masses of the people that are usually not seen in the public spaces, in the general discourse in the media to be seen, um, speaking about their problems, um, trying to reassure and uh, uh, speak with the people on the left who are uh, having some doubts, but absolutely split uh, and uh, just isolate the people who are actually anti-Ukrainian, pro-Russian, and so on and so on, because they couldn't be dealt with. It's, uh, it's more became a moral question if the people just don't understand that uh, other people have rights to live, to their independence, and uh, some such basic things. Um, they should be just isolated and uh, probably not to be reconsidered uh, ever again, because they are not on the left, actually. They are more on the far right, uh, far right than on the left. Uh, such situation, for example, in Czechia, there was a meeting of far rights together with far left uh, on the topic that okay, we want gas, uh, stop this uh, all Ukrainian stuff and give us gas. Uh, and the same was uh, in uh, German Parliament, where uh, Wagenknecht faction of uh, Die Linke, uh, together with uh, uh, alternative for, for Germany. Uh, were uh, kind of uh, having a united front on the Ukrainian-Russian issue, that they want uh, to renegotiate Nord Stream 2, that they want uh, gas, uh, and uh, dealing with Russia, that they don't want to isolate Russia, and so on and so on. So in this situation, um, really a lot of things uh, uh, 
uh, took its place. Uh, you can very easily understand who is an enemy and who is a friend, actually. So people who are friends or uh, have having doubts, speaking about this, showing what the Ukrainians are talking, uh, showing uh, some analytical articles about uh, people who know about Ukraine or Ukrainians, and uh, dealing with the issues uh, that are everyone talks about, like uh, and myths that are pushed by the far right and far left about like Maidan coup, about uh, uh, Russian Russian minority being repressed here, about Communist Party and socialist band here and repression and all of this mythology. Deal with them and just show facts. And uh, these people who are just trying to push their awful pro-Russian imperialist views just separate, just fight them and not try to reconcile. And uh, this is my opinion and this is my strategy for uh, all of the time that war is going on. So uh, yeah, uh, it's, I think, all of the questions, but we will hear it. About uh, assets of oligarchs, I absolutely agree. Uh, they need to be seized. Uh, seized. Uh, in, in US, it's easier to agitate for this um, because of the general like yes support to Ukraine and I would say that Biden administration did remarkably well and also the left and progressive that are sitting in the Democratic Party they for some reason uh, <laughs> very strangely have a good position in Ukraine uh, with supporting of all of this uh, ex of like uh, land lease ex and so on and so on but uh, the government needs to be pushed from uh, from like uh, local groups of the people, from the workers, from trade unions, from the parts of society, from the communities to continue to provide aid to Ukraine, to strengthen military aid and uh, uh, for sanctions and for, of course, uh, seizing assets of Russian oligarchs, Russian companies, property, and all of this, it helps Russia to finance their war. Uh, so the question of season kit is, should be on the priority. So I hope I answered all this, the questions. So yeah. Thank you, Vladislav. Muted, you're muted, John, unmute. John, unmute yourself. Clay, you have to, un uh, you're next, sorry, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Hello, uh, my question, and I don't know who's uh, is directed to maybe John, uh, maybe Stanley, other people might wanna chime in. It seems to me, that there's something of a split in the anti-imperialist left developing. Well, on the one hand, you have uh, what someone called the RT, well, RT Stalinist, RT leftist that hew to the uh, Russian line. And it seems to me a lot of that is centered around the uh, uh, United, uh, UNAC, United uh, Network, anti -war, or United National Anti-War Coalition. Uh, who recently came out to support, actually support the uh, the sham referendums that uh, Russia is holding in Ukraine right now. And on the other hand, you have uh, Code Pink and what the United uh, for Peace in uh, Ukraine coalition, which I suspect finds supporting a referendum and a lot of the other Russian stuff uh, a bridge too far, but at the same time prom promotes uh, a lot of the same, how you say, uh, mythology around Ukraine. You know, that NATO is responsible for the war, that the uh, 2014 coup was uh, was a coup uh, orchestrated by the West, that it's a proxy war, et cetera. But it seems to me there is kind of a divergence there that we should be exploiting and really focusing on the code pink wing of the uh, the movement, which is by far the largest and most influential. I mean, they're going around Congress now trying to shut down uh, 
funding for Ukraine, and we definitely should be responding to that. So that's my two cents. Thanks, Clay. Uh, Simon? Uh, just a quick, uh, quick comment, because uh, we're still getting to the to the point uh, about uh, Western left response to, to the war. And uh, as Vladislav said, one of the, the main topics is that mythology coming out of, uh, of, the, of the leftist circles, not, only, not uh, only leftist circles, but, but it's, it's, it's showing up in leftist circles like, I don't know, uh, that uh, the CIA, the, the, in the, to Maidan was a, a Western coup or something like that, or the Russian minority is repressed. And I just want to say about the repression of the Russian language in Kiev, which I saw uh, in a satirical way, because uh, it's so repressed in Kiev that uh, that maybe uh, all the taxi drivers are listening to Russian songs, because I, I, I acknowledge that when we were uh, driving taxis uh, all the time. So, so that's how it's uh, actually repressed you can see russian signs on on on, on this on uh, some shops you can easily talk uh, russian everywhere uh, so that's how it's repressed in the capital of of, of ukraine um so uh, basically if you just have a knowledge if you have people from ukraine or who, who go to ukraine who have uh, at least some knowledge of ukraine uh, you could easily um you know try to dismantle all this all this uh, all this myths especially those uh, i don't mean the political ones if we are, of course they're gonna be people who are gonna say about uh, all this scoop stuff all the time because because that's the only thing they can do uh, but basically all things that can be uh, shown sociologically like if you're gonna go to ukraine you're gonna see that no one is repressing anyone for for using a russian language maybe it's not you know seen as as a as a good thing to use russian now in some circles definitely but no one is repressing anyone for for russian languages you can obviously see that if you have at least like small knowledge of the country and what's happening in there so that's all for now thank you um virginia and then i don't believe stanley's spoken yet so after after virginia stanley and don't forget, Virginia, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks again for your answers. And also, um, one of the other things that's said by the, the right left is that the military equipment that's being sent in is going to everywhere and anywhere and it's being flogged off um, by uh, the sort of dubious people who receive it in Ukraine. Um, so you're not going to know where this weaponry is ending up. So. Do speak to that point, please. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, Stanley, and then Linda Mann after that. With uh, respect to Clay's points, I, I think it's very well taken. There is that split in the uh, fake anti-imperialist left. Um, we uh, have a, a site I just put in the uh, chat where we try to answer and criticize a lot of the uh, things that were done, for instance, uh, we took a code pink uh, flyer and uh, graded it, uh, you know, gave suggestions for improvement, uh, sarcasm, etc. Um, but I would say one thing, you know, they have a big, they have a big social media presence, you know, you, you get Chomsky will speak and Medea Benjamin and They'll get a lot of people will, will view it, but they can't do anything in the streets. This uh, last couple of weeks, they were supposed to have international or they call it a global campaign for peace in Ukraine. And for the, in, in view of the pictures they posted on their various sites, it was, it was virtually nothing. So I would uh, point that out. Last thing, I, I have a, another question is what happened with the strength of the far right in Ukraine, um, you know, a lot of them were participating in in the defense of the steel mill in Mariupol. Are they now seen as heroes? Were they decimated by the Russian attack? Uh, what what is going on with them? Thanks, 
Thanks, Dan. Uh, Linda? Yeah, I want to address the different, uh, the, the so-called split two in the uh, anti, uh, <clears throat> so-called anti-imperialist left. Uh, there really is no split. Um, I, I know somebody that's been involved with these people for decades and they've always been like this. Uh, one local group that's that's really um, connected to uh, Code Pink uh, was against, um, you know, basically su supported the bulk, the, the, the Serbs in the Balkan War. Uh, and I mean, their, their worst, I mean, they really showed their, their true colors in, in Syria. Um, a very small number of people stood in support of, Sir, of Sir, the Syrians and the Syrian refugees. And it was just horrible. Um, and, you know, it's embarrassing to them now that, you know, because Ukraine is winning and all these exposed, you know, all these things are being exposed and uh, they're really having to answer for some of their shitty politics. But um, I, there's no, there's just a very small number of us. Um, plus there's also um, a lot of anti-fascists who are mostly anarchists. And, and those and those folks are coming over, uh, you know, they're, they're weaning themselves away from these folks and, and taking our side too. Um, but we're just gonna have to um, let these people destroy themselves over this issue and then try and rebuild something. Okay, Thank, thanks, thanks, Linda. Uh, Nina? Uh, maybe uh, somebody brought up Chomsky and I think <laughs> RT, what we're calling the RT left is very Chomsky influenced, of course. And I wonder, is, are, were the Ukrainians not influenced? You know, why is the Ukrainian left? I mean, it's obvious why they should, um, uh, why they should, um, oh, my phone is going, um, why the left in Ukraine should be united uh, anti-Russian, but still, were they influenced by Chomsky and they were able to refuse? Or I'm guessing in Ukraine, Chomsky had some influence also. Anyway, that's my question. I didn't say it very clearly. Okay. Um, bef before we go much further, I'd just like to remind people, you know, I mean, we people are free to raise whatever they like, but the main purpose of this discussion is to get a better understanding of what's happening in Ukraine. And so I would, if people want to discuss the RT left and so on, they're free to do that. But I would encourage people to also, you know, focus some on the actual situation in Ukraine. So with that, let's see. Virginia, do you still have your hand up? Did you want to speak again? Uh, I see Avram yes. has not spoken yet. And there's also somebody that's, is that Bradley who is say uh, as Linda Mann? Um, so- I don't know how that happened, but- <laughs> Okay, uh, okay. So, so that's actually Bradley and then uh, Avram after him. Just go ahead, Bradley. Okay, yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's my intention is to circle back to not just Ukraine, but to the military question that uh, Ted raised, since that doesn't get much attention. And um, especially since this is the proximate event here is a military event, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, military questions should be front and center so long as uh, it is acting as a concentrated form of politics, which in turn is a concentrated form of economics and so on and so forth and in a schematic way. So, you know, Ted did mention, and I put a link up there from just some wiki Wikipedia evidence of Ukraine's defense industry. And it's always had a, a very important defense industry, apparently all the way up until this war. Um, so I think it's, speaking of the so-called neoliberalism, it is really a, um, 
when we're contemplating the post Maidan pro Eurozone, um, you could say pro US imperialist, capitalist governments, capitalist regime of Ukraine, and it's the direction in which it wants to go. Um, we are, you know, we're noticing that there's a contradiction between that and the actual material basis of Ukrainian life. And part of that is its military life. Okay. And I think, you know, I had mentioned before that apparently, you know, in rebuttal of the pro Putin left's claim that the United States has been ginning up a proxy war since before Maidan and continuously since then, one would think that one of the things that NATO and US would do is, is take advantage of Ukraine's already fairly strong native defense industry, military production, and build on that. But immediately we realized that that's something that the US military industrial complex <laughs> would not favor. Why would it favor building up a competitor whose, whose military designs are based upon Russian designs, by the way? Although they're all Ukrainian make since, you know, since Ukrainian independence. And in fact, I, you know, I, I'm almost certain that the Ukrainian military has been primarily relying upon its, its Ukrainian make Russian design weaponry by and large, despite all the propaganda you hear in the, in the Western press about, you know, the magic HIMAR weapons and all this kind of stuff. And but at the same time, I doubt if the U.S. and NATO ever did anything to leverage U Ukraine's substantial military production capacity in the defense of Ukraine, because frankly, they're not really interested in the defense of Ukraine. You know, they're interested in Ukraine as part of their inner imperialist rivalry with Russia and China and so on and so forth. So what this highlights, I'm going to end right here, is a contradiction that in fact has been and will continue to undermine the Ukrainian's ability to resist the Russian aggression. Uh, because you can't, you know, we have an old adage here in the US, I guess, you can't switch forces in the middle of a stream. The Ukraine can't suddenly retool with NATO weaponry overnight while it's being invaded and occupied by Russia. So, you know, to the extent that Ukraine has had successes, it's really because of Russian weaknesses, because this is a war that Russians don't want to fight, you know. So uh, I'll leave it at that, just as a question to put into people's minds with regard to the military question. Thanks. Thanks, Bradley. So I uh, see two more people with their hands up. Um, Virginia and Avram, and Avram hasn't spoken yet, so I'll call on him and, and then yourself, Virginia. Go ahead, Avram. Yes, I was shocked but not surprised about what you were talking about, the 10, 10, 10 taxes. We had a Republican right-wing candidate, Herman Cain, for the 999 taxes. To, um, and this, of course, has been going on, this kind of politics of um, neoliberalism and so the question is that what's happening in the parliament, or I don't know what you call that in the Ukraine, um, is they are steamrolling the workers. You have a horrible overtime where you're not getting paid. You have a bill that just passed where they can at will fire people or destroying unions. So the question I have is, is there any opposition or is this going to continue going on like these Bills that are really anti-worker in uh, the Ukraine. Thank you, everyone. So we have Virginia and then Clay, and then maybe we after that we can move towards um, winding up the meeting. Go ahead, Virginia. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate completely what John was saying about we want to talk about hear about what's going on in Ukraine, and most of my questions have been about that, but. At the same time, in order to make any headway with people who just are so um, convinced that this is all about NATO and, you know, bring in various also as well, various statements that 
Lenin made that was um, statements about Belgium and this sort of thing that and the, the main and, and I just would imagine that we could get from our, our wonderful speaker some things to say to that um, in order to be able to talk about Ukraine you have to you have to overcome that hurdle. And one of the main things that people say is this, the main enemy is at home, you know, which is a Karl Liebknecht uh, quote. And um, therefore we have to fight our own ruling class. Um, and um, so in terms of talking about, asking our speaker now, in terms of talking about what you say about Ukraine, what would you personally say to people who say that the main enemy is at home, we have to fight our own ruling class? How would you, you know, how would you counter that? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, Clay? Yeah. Just, Just a comment on what I know something about the uh, Ukrainian arms industry is that they have been using a lot of their Stukna uh, anti-tank uh, weapons. In fact, they regard it more highly than the Javelin, which they greatly appreciate from us. Uh, the Stukna has certain advantages, which it, the, the launcher can be separated from the camera and operating things. So the operator doesn't have to stand behind what he's launching and be a target. Uh, but also the Stukna's they have shown up in videos, and I watch these videos pretty much daily, uh, show that a lot of them were directed toward the export market. You, you can tell by the screens of Arabic or other things uh, that these were weapons that are directed toward the export market that have been diverted to uh, Ukrainian use. So that's just a comment on that particular aspect of the weapons industry. Thanks, Clay. Um, uh, Brian? Yeah, just a quick question for Vladislav. Thanks for your presentation. Um, is material aid from uh, other activists outside of Ukraine still coming on any sort of regular basis? And um, for folks who are interested, um, is there a way to send financial or other contributions directly to organizations as your own? Thank you. Thanks. If there's no more hands, I've got one or two points, and then we'll give the last word to Vladislav. So just, just in response to the question, what do you say to people who totally connect the main enemy is at home? What I've raised with people is, you know, supposing the United States invaded Venezuela, and we know that there are already Russian military installations there, and there is a close tie between the Venezuelan government and Putin. So what advice would you give to socialists? And, and if Russia sent aid to the Venezuelan government to fight against the US invasion, what advice would you give to the Russian, to Russian socialists? Would you tell them to focus on attacking their own government? and calling their own government's intervention imperialist? Or would you say, yes, Venezuela, no matter what criticisms we have uh, against their government, Venezuela, we have to oppose the US invasion there. And I've raised that with, with people on the, you know, the so-called anti-imperialist left, and they're dumbfounded. They cannot answer that question. But in general, as I said, it, you know, as a retired construction worker who's still somewhat involved with my former union, I've had a lot of contact with construction workers who support Trump. And trying to talk with them is no more useful and is no different from trying to talk with the RT left. And I just don't think that we're going to get anywhere with them. And I do think that developing a better understanding of what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Russia, is really an essential part of, of, of helping to build a new international left. And as I said, I do think that social movement 
can play an absolutely central, the Ukrainian Sosialny Ruch can play an absolutely key role in that. Um, if there's no more, then I'd ask, I'd ask Vladislav to, to give any final last words and just also remember we're going to have a discussion on Russia same time next Sunday. And so with that, um, Vladislav, do you have anything further that you'd like to comment on? Yeah, I probably would like to answer questions because there's another two pages of questions uh, for all of this uh, talk. So uh, I could fastly go uh, for these questions and then say it when you can, where you can donate to initial left -hand initiatives in Ukraine. Uh, so I think this is, is it okay? Um, yeah, okay. Then I will go. So I sent the link for donations to social Ruch in the chat. And now I will send the link for the donations to the anarchist organization uh, uh, that's uh, called Solidarity Collective and also to their Facebook page. They're mainly doing humanitarian work and we are doing political and humanitarian work. So we are also engaged, for example, in uh, like uh, uh, judicial help to the workers, uh, uh, campaigns against neoliberal government, uh, doing leaflets, uh, propagate socialists, and they're just doing humanitarian aid. So, and both organizations are great and doing their job pretty professionally. So you can donate either us or to, to the anarchists that are uh, pretty good and uh, actually yeah, have a lot more experience, I think, in the humanitarian field of uh, actions than we are. So you can look in the chat for the links. So yes, about donation. And uh, to go to all of these questions about the main enemy at the home, at, at home, uh, I think if the people are starting to quote uh, so-called classics of the Marxism or other dogmas and quotations without context, you just uh, go to them and show absolutely any article written by Marx about Russia. <laughs> it will be enough. So, and for example, uh, if you read uh, the statement on the creation of First International, the a big, a very good part about uh, defending uh, Polish resistance to Russian imperialism and fighting for independent Poland. There's nothing about like uh, socialist Poland uh, and so on and so on, or workers. It's just fighting about reactionary Russian empire for the independence of Poland. So it was the founding statement of the first international. So if you go far in the left-wing tradition, you'll find a, a lot of quotes to send on these quotes. And if person want to not just uh, uh, fight with quotation, but actually engage with reality, uh, it's a lot easier to speak about principles of self-determination, of people's right, of just right to exist and uh, to defend itself. And for example, we have a very good uh, feminist manifesto against so-called pacifist feminists uh, in the West uh, that are uh, that are just saying uh, no give arms to Ukraine because uh, you know the arms uh, empowering men that are mostly in the army and empowering this patriarchal regime and so on and so on. They're just uh, giving no subjecti subjectivity to Ukrainian. Ukrainians and not giving subject subjectivity to Ukrainian females, for example, fighting uh, and uh, for their cause and uh, them in the army, in the country, and so on and so on. So I will send this manifesto. It's also pretty good argument if you want to engage with the people uh, about what Ukrainians are thinking and why it's not correct to say that uh, the main enemy only at the, at the home. And if you even engage with Zelena, uh, which I'm highly critical of him, uh, you can find uh, great articles, for example, his article uh, on the Iron, uh, Irish question, Irish question. Uh, you can absolutely easily find the arguments, um, but it's not correct to say that main enemy always uh, at home. So even in this uh, classical Marxist writing, you can easily find the arguments against 
just using such dogmatic lines. Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, about parliament and the opposition, it's really a lot about power relations and not uh, like ideologies. Um, firstly, the ruling party is not united. They are very different people. Some of them saying that they are like left liberals and so on, and they are usually working against such laws. But if it's very important law and uh, government tries to push, then Zelensky uh, goes with like iron fist and forces everyone in the party to have party discipline. But it's very rarely that the uh, main party votes united, united on some issue. In the situation with Ukrainian parliament, if actually all of the members of his party were present in the parliament uh, and voted uh, unanimously, they would force any law because they have mono majority in the Ukrainian parliament. But it's not the case. And uh, even in the ruling party, there is a, an opposition, not an organized one, but uh, uh, like situation, uh, situational opposition. Um, and uh, the, the most like pro worker party is uh, one of like populist, agrarian, uh, center left, or even right wing. Uh, it's of course homophobic, of course anti feminist, and so on and so on, but it also. Uh, embodies a lot of people. It's called Batkivshina, which translates as uh, fatherland, uh, fatherland uh, in Ukrainian. And this party of like mostly peasants, uh, but one of the deputies of this party is actually the leader of uh, Confederation of Trade Unions in, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine, the second biggest uh, federation of trade unions, and uh, more like militant than the biggest one. And him. In this party always pushes that uh, uh, this party would, would not vote in favor of anti workers law, laws. They're always uh, the first one to vote against them and to push against them in parliament. But of course, it's party, this party is pretty conservative, um, absolutely not left, but there are some people uh, that uh, work cooperation, for example, Volonets, uh, is the mentioned uh, deputy and the leader of the uh, Confederation of Trade Unions. Uh, it's actually the main opposition against this anti workers law in parliament goes from him. And the a party of uh, previous president uh, Poroshenko that uh, situationally just votes against Zelensky because they don't like him. Uh, and uh, in some ways, uh, they were actually against this anti labor laws uh, and it creates a very strange dynamic where previously pro-Russian deputies are voting together with Zelensky on the anti-labor laws and previous presidents that pushed the same anti-labor laws voting against them because uh, being in opposition to Zelensky and just trying to fail his laws. So this kind of dynamics in the parliament. Uh, and of course, we don't have any center left or just left party in parliament, no social democratic, no liberal left, uh, nothing like this. We don't, uh, and we mostly don't have even right wing parties in the, in the parliament. We have uh, center right or populist right parties, and, and that's it. So it's very populist. Uh, parties changing their opinions, uh, and they don't don't have any logical basis. So they're mostly like oligarchical or oligarchical parties, or like uh, ideologically neoliberal parties, and, and that's it. Um, or pro Russian parties, and that's whole high identity. They like, like Putin a lot. So uh, it's the situation in the parliament. Um, about military equipment and uh, controlling of its uh, where it went. It's not hard with uh, like more hard, uh, uh, more like uh, uh, heavy weapons, tanks, rockets, artillery, and uh, anti-tank weapons. Uh, it's pretty easy to follow. Uh, Follow the weapons and uh, special services as bill kind of plays uh, a role of military police that are policing uh, the way that the weapon moves in Ukraine. And it's absolutely impossible, for example, for far right to have uh, some artillery piece that are not registered or something stalled uh, from the uh, these donations from the Western powers. But with the uh, like light weapons, uh, the situation uh, a lot more dire. 
and uh, this uh, th these are weapons that not mostly uh, sent by the Western powers. It's manufactured there, uh, but uh, they, there are a lot of ways to have like uh, machine guns and uh, assault rifles uh, moved from the army to black market or other organizations. And it's kind of a normal situation in Ukraine, unfortunately. Um, and government don't do a lot with this. We have a special service, uh, SBU, that tries to fight it, but uh, there's uh, not enough of them to control every direction. So small, uh, some small amount of uh, uh, weapons just goes unregistered, uh, unnoticed, and can be in black market and so on and so on. But it's only light weapons and a small part. And uh, mostly not the weapons that are being sent by the Western powers. And uh, our government actually um, tries to fight these weapons in very American way. They just, just want to legalize uh, individual firearms. It's absolutely awful idea, especially uh, in this time, uh, because there are a lot of traumatized people, for example, and uh, not controlling weapons will be a tragedy. Uh, but they just don't want to deal with this. Uh, so it's kind of th this situation about the weapons. And uh, to talk next, it's about for rights. Um, for rights is strong, but uh, not as strong as before the war, because war gave a ground, a possibility for trade unions, for uh, left wing organization, for anarchists, socialists, social democrats to participate in the army. And that broke the monopoly of far right on anti imperialism. Popularity of the far right in Ukraine builds mostly not on the, their ideology of like racism, chauvinism, and so on, but that they were the main people who were strongly anti imperialist in terms of Russia and uh, strongly pro Ukrainian in terms of national question and so on and so on. So they just monopolized the sphere while uh, the left was in chaos. And uh, I would say they. Well, uh, they were more left-wing on the left-wing agenda than the left. So they appropriated the most uh, left-wing topics and what was uh, important for the masses and used this to indoctrinate people because in 2014, uh, only way to defend uh, your like country, to defend your people was uh, going through the far-right regimes because they monopolized the situation in the army. They're only one for organized uh, in the situation where Ukrainian army wasn't existing uh, like at all. Uh, but now there are trade union organizations in the army, there are left wing organizations in the army, there are all kinds of people in the army that are legitimizing itself uh, and uh, show that not only far right can defend, uh, defend the people, that uh, left can also engage with the masses and uh, with what masses want and defend against imperialism. And that really makes Politically, far right, uh, absolutely non important. Nobody would want after this war uh, for far right because um, all of their agenda is already done. So, Ukraine is fighting against Russia and developing on national question. It's the most agenda of far right that gives them a popularity. And they would have a monopoly on the like uh, patriotism because a lot of the left wing also fighting. So, politically, I think. Uh, the right wing will lose in this war. But uh, in terms of like uh, heroization, I would say that uh, nobody would elect like political representation of uh, Azov battalion in the parliament or something like this. But Azov battalion will, will have this uh, heroic uh, look around them. And I think that uh, some small crimes or violence or corruption by them would be just gone unnoticed uh, by the officials after the war. And that uh, this will be like a medium sized problem in Ukrainian society. That these people are absolutely legalized them themselves and theorized themselves in the Ukrainian society. So it's something that Ukrainian left and just Ukrainian society in general should uh, would deal uh, later because it's the it's reality. Uh, we have what we have. Um, so yeah, but uh, I don't think that's like political popularity of far right um, would have any ground in Ukraine after this. I think even worse than now. Now we don't have any far right deputy or one far right deputy, I don't remember 
in the parliament. Uh, and after the war, it, it just wouldn't be actual because everyone speaks of the main topics that uh, gave possibility for the far right to give ground. It's about language, national question, anti-imperialism, uh, like fighting against uh, Russian dominance and so on. So it's about far right and Mm, what we have? Okay, we have the question about Komsky, uh, Chomsky and uh, his influence. I, I would say that uh, influence of uh, general Western discourse is pretty strong in Ukraine, in Ukrainian left. So it was problematic before the war because we, even in Social Nero, made a lot of uh, absolutely false positions and uh, uh, a lot of mistakes dealing with the war. Uh, because of this false pacifism and uh, I, uh, and of the West left wing discourse, because there are a lot of dogmas that you, you need to deal with, and it creates a situation where, uh, for example, speaking against NATO imperialism was more important than speaking about your security, or like speaking against militarization was more important than preparing for the war, and so on and so on. So such things were existing in in the Ukrainian left and were pretty strong. And before the war, I would say that most of the people, for example, would be against uh, going uh, uh, in the officer academies or a territorial defense and studying there and preparing for the war. But when the war started, uh, it just uh, denigrated a lot. And uh, this main question, everyone adopted the same position. So, but on the secondary questions, there are a lot still of this influence of the dogma of such people as Komsky, but not only him, but in general, this West and left discourse. Uh, and it's it's problematic, but not very seriously, uh, because it's only secondary questions. Uh, and the yeah, uh, Ukrainian left should like, develop the ways to deal with its own situation and not just try to copy what uh, Western left saying. And uh, that's something that we will work on. And uh, such problem exists, but I don't think it's strong. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's all about the question. Then I, I think I can say a few ending thoughts. First, uh, thank you a lot for still being interested in Ukraine, because a lot of other people just uh, ignore this and just, OK, we have this. Uh, uh, media think uh, a few months popular uh, and now okay uh, just getting used to it and speaking about okay the death of queen or something like this but people who are determined uh, determined to show solidarity even after such time and to agitate for weapons and actually for things that are helping helping for Ukrainians to survive to fight for their lives just for for the right to live most and for all and second, for, for the right to be themselves, uh, to write for the self-determination, it's very it's very respectful thing to do, I, think, I would say. And thank you a lot for this. And I hope that the solidarity wouldn't be gone and uh, it will continue and it will help to create a new and stronger than ever left. So thank you for this. <laughs>